See, Linda's good. She can play and look out there. So when I'm playing, I'm like, I can't look sideways. Let's pray as we uh, get into God's word this morning. Father, we thank you for speaking to us through your scriptures. We thank you for giving us uh, the Bible that we can read from it, that we can, we can learn about who you are and learn to be more like you. I pray that this morning that you will help, and, uh, that you will help to open our hearts to, to hear from your word and to leave here different because of it. In your name I pray, amen. I have a friend, and for the sake of today's story, we'll call him Wes. He's a young guy I met a couple years ago, and uh, he was skateboarding. I was BMX, and so we, you know, I, we got a good friendship going on. He's a good kid, and uh, so I invited him to come to the youth group that I was working with, and so he started coming, and he, 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 he was a good kid. He had a good heart. He wasn't obnoxious like the rest of them was. I mean, he acted the fool every once in a while, but he was slightly toned down. He would listen. He was absorbing the truth. And so as I, as I it's a little loud, sorry, <laughs> caused some hearing damage. Uh, as, as we built a, a ministry there and as it worked and invested in his life, his heart just kept absorbing the truth and, and he wanted more. And so uh, I remember the day that he came to me and he said, you know what? I want to get baptized. I want to become a Christian. And so I was excited. I was like, this is great. Let's get, let's get this going. And so we talked to his parents. His parents supported the decision. And we, we did. One, one Wednesday evening, he came forward and, uh, and we baptized him. Baptized him into Christ. And I wish I could say that from that point on, Wes followed the Lord. That he lived for the Lord. That his spiritual roots went deep. And he, and he loved the Lord the rest of his life. But that's not how it went. He got, he got baptized. He became a Christian. But then from that point on, the world started to push against him. And his faith wasn't deep enough. His friends started to push against him. He didn't have the support of godly parents. The world, media, society, everything pushed against him. And his roots failed. And he dropped his faith. As far as I know, I hope, I hope someone else found him and spoke into his life. And brought him back. But as far as I know, that, that his, his faith didn't, it didn't stick. It didn't, it didn't take. And so I wonder if, if there's a problem today in our generation as we talk about, uh, we're going through this, uh, this book called You Lost Me by Dave Kinnaman. It's, um, and he discusses the problems of why we are losing this next generation, the 18 to 29 year olds, why they're leaving the faith leaving church and rethinking their faith. And so one of the chapters in the book talks about shallow faith and how young people have shallow faith and how the faith that they receive from the church, from their parents, isn't deep enough to stand up under the attacks that the devil throws at us. And because of that, they've left. And so as I was wrestling with that and thinking with that, I thought this is exactly what Wes was dealing with. He wasn't rooted strongly enough in Christ, and so he walked away from his faith. Now there's a lot of things going on here. Maybe, maybe he, uh, as we look at this problem of young people leaving the church, maybe they were given the best spiritual education. Maybe they were brought up in a church home. Maybe they were just stubborn and they wanted to leave the faith. But for whatever reason it is, I want to examine our responsibility. I want to examine our roles as Christian men and women who are leaders in the church, leaders in the home, and see where we can do a better job of imparting a faith that's rooted in Christ that will bring young people to him. And so as we were, as I was going through the book, some of the things that the, the young people were complaining or voicing about the church, some of the things that the church is not providing for them. And so one of the things that kept coming up was the, the fact that church is boring. Church is boring. And so a large percent, about 40, uh, high 40s, said that church is boring is completely true or mostly true of me. Now, a couple weeks ago, some of you came to church and you had no idea, but after service, you got the opportunity to carry a 600-pound radiator to the basement. This church isn't boring. You never know what's going to happen. It, you never know whose mic is going to turn on, turn off. It is exciting here. Let me tell you, you come up here and get a guitar and try to play, my heart is going crazy all service long. But if we, if we really get, get serious and think about the statement, church is boring, aren't we the church? So does that mean that we're boring? Is the faith that we're giving to young people, to, to anyone, is it a boring faith? Come in, sit down, listen to me, leave. 
Or is it a faith that empowers them to go out and to change the world? Come in here. Be encouraged from the word. Be encouraged from singing. Be encouraged from meeting with each other. And leave ready to equip, ready to change the world, ready to share your faith. Kind of scary. But I think that's a faith that's more attractive. Church is boring. Uh, another thing that, that young people are wrestling with is, is faith is not relevant to my career or my interests. Uh, I think sometimes as, 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 as a minister, I, as I'm telling young people uh, to follow Christ, I make it only two options, three options for their faith and their life. You can either become a minister, a stay-at-home mom, or church secretary. Those are the only things that you can do to combine faith and occupation. I think you'd laugh. That's funny. What if we were a church that empowered young people to be the best nurse they could be? That they could go out and change the world in their nursing occupation. I was speaking to a lady this week who shared how she uh, gets an opportunity to speak with people every day. She has a captive audience. They can't really get up and leave. You can get up and leave. Please don't. Uh, but with, with nursing, you've got people that are there. They, they, they share their heart. What if we were able to equip the young people of this next generation to become the best godly carpenters, the best godly teachers, the best godly producer supply workers that they can be where they influence the world for Christ? These next two, uh, my church does not prepare me for real life and my church does not help me find my purpose. Do we equip young people to, to, to real life situations a lot of times I build situations where, where you, you know, I talk about a young person who's walking home from school, and then you meet these guys on the corner, these bullies that are going to chase after you and beat you up and steal your lunch money. And what do you do? You give the Bible school answers. You pray, say Jesus' name, and read the Bible, and everything will be better. So as these big, tough guys are chasing after you, stopping you, you say, hey, let's pray, let's have a Bible study, and I'll baptize you in the name of Jesus, and everything will be better. That's, that's too simplistic. Let's wrestle with the problems that are going on in this world today. This guy who's losing his orphanage. Let's wrestle with that. Let, let's, let's bring faith into the real context of, of, of life today. Uh, our church prepares people for real life. Our church helps people to find their purpose to living out their faith. These last two, I think they're kind of personal to us as the church. The Bible is not taught clearly or often enough, and God seems missing from my experience. A church. There's a large percent of young people who say that's why they left church, because God wasn't there, because I didn't, I didn't hear about him, I didn't see him. And, and I listen to that, and I think, what are we doing? Well, where was the disconnect from, from talking about this to, to imparting it to young people? And so I, I wonder what we need to do, what we need to rethink, what we need to invest into the lives of young people today. Because if we keep doing church like this, what we're going to get is we're going to get young people who view God like this. Some uh, two people who are studying youth generations today, Christian Smith and Melinda uh, Denton, write this. Young Americans describe God as something like a com combination of a div divine butler here to serve us and a cosmic therapist. He's always on call, takes care of your problems that arise, professionally helps his people feel better about themselves but does not become personally involved in the process. Is that the picture of the God that you serve? God is more than a divine butler, a therapist, here to help you make you feel good about yourself. My Savior wants to get into your life. He wants to do some work. He wants to bring about a righteous life in our hearts. He's more than just some guy that's serving us drinks and making us feel good. He's a God that wants to get involved in our lives. And so I'm excited. I, I love the ministries that we have going on here at First Christian. Kevin, when you were asking us to take 10 minutes to be silent, did you hear what was going on downstairs? Uh, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be silent. And the only thing I could hear was, my Redeemer lives. I'm thinking, that's cool. There are young people right now, that's the only time I'll sing a solo in church. There's young people downstairs right now worshiping our Savior, learning about the truths from the Bible. If you look in your bulletin in the middle section there, there's what they learned and then a Bible verse. My little preschool kids can say those Bible verses because they're learning it here. I'm excited to say that our church has a very high percent of adults that are involved in small groups. If you're involved in a small group, if you're hosting small groups at your house, thank you. 
Let's get involved with that. Let's learn. Let's, let's dig into the scriptures. We've got an active youth group. We've got visions where we can, we can put our faith into action. Next Sunday, we're going to go to Rolling Meadows. We're going to have an opportunity to share with widows, with, with, with people who are, are, are isolated by themselves for the most part. We're going to go and we're going to brighten their day, show them God's love. And so this is a church that's doing, that's doing good, that's working diligently to reverse those trends that we just covered. But at the same time, we're facing very staggering odds because there's a lot of churches that are embracing those and, and, and not equipping young people with deep faith. The life that young people are living in the society today is equipping them to fail as well. There's some fancy words I want to talk about here for a second. Young people today feel pressured to become narcissists. Narcissism is this, uh, this idea that uh, they are excessive self-admiration and self-centeredness. In other words, life is all about me. Life is all about me. Life is all about me. And so it's hard to, to share with young people that it's not about them, that it's about our Savior, it's about others, when all they hear is it's about you, it's about you. Have it your way. It's all about you. Another thing that young people are wrestling with is entitlement, the belief that one deserves certain privileges. I think some young people today would rewrite the inalienable rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, a cell phone by 10, and a brand new car by 16. Why? Because I'm entitled that way. I should have my college education paid for. I should get out of school and have a $75,000 a year job, first job. I should get a job within a month. You know, all these unrealistic expectations, entitlement. The world deserves to give this to me. And then out of proportion, self-confidence. Confidence that you can do everything by yourself. You want to be the president of America? No problem. You can do that. Astronaut, you can be anything you want in the world. Yes, you can. But it's going to take a lot of hard work. It's going to take a very, very uh, large amount of diligence and perseverance. But as our, as our world teaches these kids that, that, that to be narcissists, to be entitled to this unrealistic self, uh, out of proportion self-confidence, then they miss humility. They miss the fact that we are sinful, fallen people in need of a savior. There's, um, there's not a lot of room, not a lot of compelling reasons to sit in the dirt at the feet of Jesus and live the humble life of a disciple if you're already perfect. If everything in your life is good and God's only responsibility is to be your divine butler and to help you feel better about yourself, then why would you want a savior? Why would you want him to come in and clear the sin out of your life? Instead, we need to impart in our young people the truth found in Isaiah 61. If you've got your Bibles, open up Isaiah chapter 61. It's on page 607 in your pew Bibles. Now, if you don't have a pew Bible, I got a couple up here. Uh, you split in the middle, you get to Psalms, and then you got Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Song, Isaiah. So it's got a little road map up there to help you out finding where it's at. If you're in Jeremiah, back up one book. Isaiah chapter 61. Now, the context here is Israel is, is living in sin. God is using a foreign nation to punish them, to bring them back to righteous living. And so he's using Babylon to bring them back. And so Isaiah is speaking to the people in Isaiah chapter 61. We'll pick up the read in verse 1. This is Isaiah speaking to the people. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. The Holy Spirit is working in Isaiah's life. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Now imagine if you're a captured nation under foreign control. You're poor. You don't get to keep the things you do, the, the things you work for. You're a slave. Everything you do, everything you produce is captured away from you by the government. And so this, this good news of the poor, hey, freedom, I want to get out of here. I want my own farm, I want my own life. So Isaiah is preaching this to them. He, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, to release from darkness for the, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. As he's, as he's preaching this, they're thinking of the year of Jubilee, where everything is canceled. All debts are canceled every 50 years. All debts are canceled Slaves go free, and the land is allowed to rest. And as a captured people, this sounds good. I want to get out of here. I want freedom. So it continues. And the day of vengeance of our Lord, sounds good. Have God fighting on your side. To comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, and oil of gladness instead of mourning. 
and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Isaiah is saying, it's going to get better when we get out of here. What your responsibility to do is, is to live a righteous life. Stop living in sin, and you'll stop getting in trouble. The last part of verse 3. Then you will be called, they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Now, as we're going through that, maybe some of you sound, heard that and you, you thought, that's familiar. It's because we just looked at that this week in, in small groups. It's in Luke chapter 4. Go over to Luke chapter 4. Keep your finger here in Isaiah 61, but turn over to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, it's on page 834 in your Bibles. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. This is where Jesus is, the only time in his ministry where he's given a, a scroll, given the Bible, and they say to him, pick what you like to read. And so he opens it up and he goes to Isaiah 61, and he picks this passage of scripture. Isaiah 61, or excuse me, Luke chapter 4, verse 18 through 19. This is Jesus talking. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Verse 20. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. Everyone in the synagogue had their eyes fastened on him, and he began to say to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus takes what Isaiah prophesies in chapter 61 and brings it forward and says, This is about me. This is about me. I'm the good news. Look at verse 18 again. The spirit of the Lord is on me. Just a couple chapters before this, in Luke chapter 3, Jesus is baptized. Luke chapter 3, verse 21. Jesus is baptized by John. The spirit comes on him. He's filled with the spirit. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Now, I think Jesus is talking more than just poor, financially poor. I think he's talking about spiritual poor, about spiritual bankruptcy here. Because if we look at the four things that he lists, uh, good news to the poor, freedom for the prisoners, sight for the blind, and release from the oppressed. I don't think he's talking about setting up a, a soup kitchen, you know, to feed the poor, setting up a, a, a prison ministry, set up an optometrist office, and then again, release for the oppressed, fighting against the Romans. I don't think he's, he's talking about a world or earthly ministries. Those are good but I think he's talking about the year of the Lord's favor, which would be him dying on the cross. And why did he come to die on the cross? Well, that's the good news. That's the gospel message. He died on the cross to set us free from our spiritual bankruptcy, from being poor in spirit. Proclaim freedom for prisoners. Prisoners to sin, that's our hearts. That's our lives. We're captives to that. We're being oppressed by Satan. Uh, we, again and again, we're, we're captured by, by sin. And recovery for sight for the blind. If you go over to Luke chapter 6, a couple pages to the right. Luke chapter 6, verse 39. Listen to those pages turn. That's good stuff. Verse 39. This is the, uh, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Verse 37 says, do not judge or you will be judged. This is a couple weeks ago, the, the sermon Verse 39 says this, and he also told them this parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? He was talking about the Pharisees, these sinful, hypocritical, self-righteous guys. He says, sin causes you to be blind to yourself. And then he goes on, uh, verse 41. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? Sin in our lives causes us to be blind. So go back to Luke chapter 4. Jesus is talking about the fact that he came to forgive sins. He came to release us from spiritual bondage. He came to bring us sight. He came to forgive us of our sins. So we go all the way back to Isaiah. Go back to Isaiah chapter 61. I hope you kept your fingers in there. Isaiah chapter 61. Now Jesus doesn't finish the rest of this. He stops there in verse 2. Because the rest of verse 2 says this, Isaiah 61 verse 2. And the day of vengeance of our God, that day hasn't come. That day will come. I think he stops there intentionally because his mission is not to bring about righteous vengeance at that time in Luke 4. It will come. But Jesus' responsibility, what his call is, is to finish the rest of it out, to comfort those who mourn, provide for those who grieve in Zion, bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of spirit of despair. 
and they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planning for the Lord for the display of his splendor. I love this idea of oaks of righteousness. Christ came to root us in him and then let us grow as, as oaks of righteousness, as people for his splendor, as, as, as mature, righteous believers that grow in the faith daily, that root ourselves in Christ and stand on his word. And so as I read this, and I put myself in here, Christ came to preach the good news to the poor. I'm poor. I'm spiritually bankrupt. I'm captive. I'm the prisoner. He came to set me free. And then he came to do the work in my life to set me up as an oak of righteousness, as someone who stands in his truth and brings the world back to also stand with them in Christ's truth. I think, of, I think of an oak tree. I think of a tree that's planted in the ground that doesn't move. Trees don't lose. Cars lose. You swerve for a bunny, you hit a car. That's a bad idea. When trees are planted in the ground, they don't move. This is a picture of my dad and mom's. This is their barn. It, they, um, we moved into that farm. Well, it's a little house in Illinois, in Custer Park. But that's their barn that's on their property. Okay, this is what it looks like now. This next one here. That's what it looks like now. That was a lot of work. This is actually almost 20 years later. But that, go back to the, go to the next one. This is that barn. Now, there's, there's three skinny kids up on the roof. I'm one of them. Uh, but when we moved into that house and we got that barn, you can tell there's a lot of repair that that barn needed. One of the problems that the barn had, it leaned 17 inches to the left. The whole thing leaned 17 inches to the left. Now, I think if you'd gone into the upper, upper floor there and you ran and jumped and landed, you could have probably gotten the whole thing to just fall over. Now, you probably would have fallen through the floor and then the barn would crush you. But that barn was in some serious need of repair. And so what we did, you see that top window up there? We strung a cable through that top window and we went all the way across the yard. Go to the next slide. And we, uh, we attached that cable. See that tree way in the back? We attached that cable around that tree, stretched it all the way to that barn, and then we jacked that barn back up. Now, you got a cable stretching the entire length of the yard, you better put on a helmet, a full body harness, and a cable and zip line out of it. That was really cool. And that is not me. I've never been that skinny in my life. I have much more muscular physique. That's my cousin. Uh, but it was great. It was a lot of fun. That zip line was good. It probably wasn't safe, uh, but it was a good time. The only way we could restore that barn is if we corrected it from leaning. The only way we could correct it from leaning is if we attached it to something that wasn't moving. That tree, it wasn't going anywhere. So we wrapped the cable around that tree, hit the come along, pulled that barn back up. That tree was rooted in the ground. It wasn't going anywhere. And until we are rooted in Christ and living as oaks of righteousness... We're not going to make a difference in this world. But when we find ourselves rooted in Christ, when we as the church, when we find ourselves rooted in Christ, then we can bring the world to truth. Then we can raise up godly children, every generation, that will follow him. But only when we as the church root ourselves in Christ and live as righteous oaks can we bring the world to repentance. The same thing for our, our families. God has given us a responsibility to invest in the lives of the young children that live in our homes. And unless we root ourselves in Christ and live righteously and then bring those young children up to follow him, we'll lose this next generation and the one that follows after that and the one that follows after that. And so as we talk about passing on the faith, as our church passes the faith on to the next generation, as we as parents pass the faith on to the next generation, they're not going to get what we don't have. They can't catch what we can't give. And so if we're not reading our Bibles daily, how are they going to learn that? If we're not on our knees every night to pray for them, how are they going to pick up on that? And so we need to be the ones that are setting the example. And it needs to start in the home. Because when there are godly moms and dads, godly grandpas and grandpas, grandmas and grandpas, godly aunts and uncles, when it starts in the home and we root ourselves in Christ, we follow his word, we live daily for him, then we can bring the rest of the world back to repentance and bring them to see his truth. Now, it's never over. You're not done. 
It's never too late to invest in the lives of young people. This is a coffee table that I thought I had finished a couple weeks ago for my wife. Now, some of you who have come to the Wednesday Ladies Bible Study, you were here this day. You see that chair in the background? That's Tom Fowler. That's your chair. And I was sitting in it because you weren't there. I was sitting in that chair. Bible study was done. All the ladies were sitting around. We were chit-chatting about our lives. And as I'm sitting in my chair looking at the coffee table that I thought was done, the, 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 all the blood just drained out of my face. I sat up in this, this, this sheer terror of what? And I look at the table, and there's a pencil line running the entire length of the table. Now, we have a three-year-old and a four-year-old. If they had done that, I would have been totally fine. I would have been completely okay. If they had permanent markered it, I would have been okay. But I'm looking at the coffee table, and this pencil line that's running the whole distance is my fault. I made a mistake. A huge mistake. And it's running across the entire coffee table. Now the ladies are like, oh, it doesn't look bad. Jane, you actually said, it doesn't look bad because the corner over here is kind of nicked up too because it all just kind of fits in. I thought, (laughs) what are you saying? So she's just trying to make me feel good about myself. But I'm looking at at the finished product and I think it's not too late. I can take this back downstairs. I can work on this and I can fix it. So I did. I carried it back downstairs. My wife is like, it's fine. Don't touch it. I'm like, I'm going to fix the table. So I carried it in the basement, sanded that, that pencil line off. I still have a blister on both of my fingers from sanding that pencil line off. I get the line out. Perfect. The line is gone. Now I have a trench in my coffee table. That's okay. I put some stain on, put some clear coat on. It looks horrible. She comes down. She's crying. You broke my coffee table. <sighs> so then I go from making the trench to taking the entire coat off. The entire thing. Take it all down to bare wood. I had six coats of polyurethane. Two coats of stain. That's a lot of sanding. I come up, my hair's all gray. The kids are like, what are you doing? Sanding. What if I had done it right the first time? What if when I made that that first cut, my sheet of plywood was upside down like it was supposed to, so it didn't splinter the wood? What if my pencil lines were on on the bottom side? Not on the top side. I made a mistake. What if when I was building it, I noticed the mistake and erased it with a pencil eraser? That'd be easy. What if I had done that? What if I'd seen it while I was putting two coats of stain, rubbing it into the pencil line? Six coats of polyurethane. I could have seen it at any time, but I didn't. We need to do it right the first time. Parents, you have young children. Invest in their lives spiritually today. It's easier to build strong children and fix broken men. It's Frederick Douglass. It's easier to invest in this generation when they're young than when they're old and set in their ways. But at the same time, it's never too late. It's never too late to go back down. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take more time. It's going to take, it, it might hurt you, but it's worth it. I'll just tell you, the coffee table is done. I had to take it down a couple more times, but it's done. But the lives of the young people, the lives of your brothers, your sisters, your family. Is there sin in their lives? And you see it? It's time for you to stand as an oak of righteousness and bring them to repentance. Maybe it's going to take a little bit longer. And and catch this. We are never done investing in the lives of young people, investing in the lives of those around us. You're never to a point where you're too old to go back to work to bring in people to know who Jesus Christ. If you're breathing, you've still got life. You've still got an opportunity to invest, to bring people back to the truth. If you've been freed from your sins, rooted in Christ, and living as an oak of righteousness, it's time we bring the world back to him and give them a deep faith. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your cross. We thank you for giving your son to die on it and giving us life. We pray that you will help us to live, live lives rooted in you that bring people to know who you are. We thank you for, for giving everything you bless us with. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. If you've never made that decision to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord of your life, as the musicians come forward, I encourage you to do that today. Come forward. Put Christ in your heart. Accept him. Accept the promise that he gives as we stand and sing this song.